We also have a lot of free patient education material on healer.com, uh, which helps people with dosage programs and some basic information about how to get good results with cannabis, uh, maximizing the benefit and minimizing the potential harm. And, um, and then we also have products. So Healer has hemp products, uh, including CBD and CBDA products. And then also uh, we are launching a CBG product, which I will tell you more about tonight. For those of you that are interested in the Healer certified training program, uh, you can get a $50 discount with the code webinar. Uh, so $50 off for that. For anyone that wants to purchase our um, CBD, uh, CBG drops, uh, the code CBG will give you a 20% discount on that. Also, I like to put in a plug for my book, The Handbook of Cannabis for Clinicians. Uh, if you are a clinician, this book is for you. If you're not a clinician, it's probably not the right book for you. And actually, Bonnie's book would probably be uh, um, better because it's kind of written to anyone. Bon Bonnie, um, Bonnie Goldstein is our guest tonight. I'll introduce her in just a moment. Um, but wow, I think, I think that's about it. So the format of the, uh, the webinar tonight is that we're going to spend probably about 45 minutes talking about tonight, we're going to start with some of the basic uh, science around CBG, and then we're going to dig into all the latest, everything that I could find, basically, that I thought was relevant, uh, published about CBG, and even some things that have not yet been published, uh, and that's probably from within the last six months or so. Then we can take a little stretch break and spend the, the rest of the evening, maybe another 45 minutes or so, uh, answering questions and having a dialogue, because uh, tonight's focus is CBG, and I think we have a lot to learn about CBG. It's, it's very new, and uh, nobody's the expert, but uh, having Bonnie here, uh, she probably has uh, more clinical experience with it, uh, definitely more than I do, and probably more than many people, even though I think we're all still learning a lot. So uh, Bonnie Goldstein, for those of you that don't know her, um, and I'm sure that most of you do, she is a cannabis clinician, expert, uh, educator, author, and, um, and dear friend, and really my, um, my secondary motivation for having you tonight, Bonnie, is we don't get to hang out at conferences much <laughs> anymore. And it's uh, important for us to have these conversations about uh, what's happening with our patients and in our practices. And I feel like this community uh, could benefit from, the, from overhearing our, our dialogue on this topic. Bonnie's background is in pediatric emergency medicine. Uh, she's come a long way since then, uh, treating adults and children. She's uh, located in the Los Angeles area. Um, and anything else I should mention about your practice, Bonnie? Uh, nope. Uh, I think you covered it all. Okay. All right, great. Well, I am going to uh, share some slides. Oh, and then for everyone that's watching, um, we're happy to entertain your questions. We got some questions submitted ahead of time and we'll make sure we hit those, um, but you can um, submit questions in the chat and we'll keep track of those. You can raise your hand. We really love live questions where we're able to dialogue with you. Um, but if you wanna just submit a, a text question, we're happy to field those as well. However, during the slide presentation, I know I don't have enough attention to watch the chat and speak and watch the slides. Bonnie may or may not. Um, and, uh, and so um, don't expect us to respond if you're just chatting uh, during the slides, but we can come back to those questions afterwards. So I'm going to get the slideshow started. Great. So the topics for tonight, we have a review of the mechanisms of action of CBG. Let's see, I'm kind of lost the window with everybody. There we go. And, uh, and then we're gonna jump into some of the newer research. So we'll look at the effects of CBG in a mouse model of PTSD, a uh, study in mice on CBGA and its uh, potential anti-epileptic effects. Another study that's just a, a cell cancer cell study looking at CBG and brain cancer, a study that looked at the anti-inflammatory effects of CBG and CBD, both alone and in combination in a model of lung inflammation, and then a case series of CBG and CBD in patients with Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia. And 
Before we dig in, I just want to um, give a little uh, remembering of another clinician in the field who recently passed away. That's Alan Frankel. Uh, I wasn't very close with him, but we had some really wonderful conversations at conferences. And uh, from time to time, uh, uh, he, he helped me with some insight. And so I was really thankful for him. And uh, I know that he helped a lot of patients and was very caring to his patients. Um, and so uh, he passed away recently. And so I just thought we would remember him. And then also, um, well, well, yeah, let, let's, let's move on from that. So, um, oh, and then, and then here's uh, some images of our hemp farm here in Maine. Uh, it's not my farm, but it's where Healer uh, derives its starting material. And you can see I'm pictured in the back uh, with Brad Foyer on the left. He's the CEO of Healer. And in the middle is uh, Ben, our uh, lead farmer. He, he runs this farm. It's called Sheepscot Farm in central Maine. And uh, you can see some healthy looking plants there. And then our newer, our newest product is the uh, Healer CBG drops. It's uh, around 50 milligrams per milliliter uh, total cannabinoids, uh, similar to our CBD products. And again, we have this kind of six to one uh, neutral versus acidic ratio. So it has a decent amount of uh, CBGA in there as well. And uh, again, discount code CBG will get you 20% off. So let's, let's start uh, at the beginning with CBG and uh, Bonnie, and then also Ethan, if you're interested, I'm, I'm happy to take any comments. But uh, so CBG has been um, considered or called the, uh, the mother of the cannabinoids or the, the stem cell uh, cannabinoid. And I, you know, I think that that comes from really the, the uh, CBGA. So the plant uh, takes these two precursors and converts them into CBGA. And then typically the CBGA is pretty quickly converted into the other acidic cannabinoids like THCA and CBDA. It could also be converted via heat and decarboxylation into CBG. And as many of you know, THCA is the precursor to Delta 9 THC, CBDA is the precursor to CBD and so forth. And so what's happened recently uh, just in the last few years is that breeders have been developing varieties of plant that lack uh, these enzymes uh, almost completely. Uh, so the THCA synthase and the CBDA synthase, when they're not present, CBGA will accumulate in the flowers. So up until now, the only real way to get any kind of decent amount of CBG or CBGA in flowers was to kind of use horticultural practices and harvest early, which would decrease overall yields, and you still wouldn't get much CBG, even though I've seen people, you know, strive for that and, and get, you know, low amounts of it in the final product. Uh, but now uh, without, with these varieties that lack these enzymes, high levels of CBG can be obtained. And so this is something that people have been exposed to uh, through their use of cannabis and hemp for a long time, but uh, until recently, never at very high quantities, or at least um, not as the dominant uh, cannabinoid that they're, they're exposed to. And so something new to learn from it. Now, there were uh, two review articles, or one is a chapter and one is a review article uh, that are recent. Uh, this one on the top right, the pharmacological case for cannabigerol. Uh, this came out in uh, this year in 2021. And then there was a chapter that I found useful in this textbook which has a terrible name, uh, even though there's some good things in the textbook. Uh, and this was from 2017. And this was a, another review of CBG. And, and the, it was these two review articles that I used to um, gather the information about the mechanisms of action. And so this is what I want to talk about first is, um, you know, how does CBG work in the body? And so let's start out. First of all, it's been shown to readily cross the blood brain barrier at least in rodents. And so it probably does that in humans, certainly seems like it does. As far as the main targets of THC, the CB1 and CB2 receptor, it seems like CBG is a bit more like THC, at least in comparison with CBD, because it, it does have some partial agonist activity at these receptors like THC does, but a much lower binding affinity. And different studies have found it to be anywhere between five and 27 fold uh, lower affinity than THC. So it does have a little bit of activity at CB1 and CB2, but it might require large doses of it to get a significant amount of activity to make a difference, but could be a really nice uh, synergistic effect 
with THC and perhaps with our own endocannabinoid system. It, um, it affects many ion channels, like so many of uh, its sister compounds in plant. So CBD and CBG are very comparable at uh, trip A1, trip B1, trip B2, and so forth. Uh, of note here, the trip V1 receptor, also known as the capsaicin receptor, uh, which is a target that can affect pain and inflammation and have some uh, psychiatric effects as well. Trip M8 has received some attention uh, in a treatment for prostate cancer. Uh, it seems like prostate cancer cells can be susceptible to trip M8 uh, agonists. And um, you know we have a lot more to learn about that. But in, in, in terms of these ion channels, CBD and CBG, have a lot of overlap. So here's where things get new. The alpha-2 adrenoceptor, which is um, a G protein receptor that sits kind of like the CB1 receptor on the uh, presynaptic terminal. So we have uh, an image of a, a nerve synapse here. We have the presynaptic nerve and the postsynaptic nerve. And typically in, um, in the cannabis world, when we show this, we're, we're showing how uh, the endocannabinoids are um, kind of these uh, negative um, feedback messengers to get uh, the presynaptic nerve to stop releasing its neurotransmitter. Now this, so this model looks very similar, but what we're seeing here is not an endocannabinoid effect, but it's actually directly a norepinephrine effect. So, so this would be a part of the sympathetic nervous system. That's the fight or flight nervous system, uh, one junction here. And we have uh, depolarization and we have this presynaptic nerve releasing norepinephrine. The norepinephrine will stimulate the alpha-1 receptor on the postsynaptic nerve. And then it also when there's enough of that, when the levels in the synapse are high enough, it will stimulate the alpha-2 receptor this alpha-2 receptor then shuts down the release of more norepinephrine. So it's another negative feedback mechanism. Now, um, especially in the periphery and probably also in the brain, the CB1 receptor can serve this purpose. It can, uh, sh when there's excessive amounts of norepinephrine, the peripheral cells will produce anandamide, which will be another way of shutting down further release of norepinephrine via the CB1 receptor. But this target, alpha-2, is very interesting. When it's stimulated, it decreases the activity of the sympathetic nervous system. One study that compared it with the drug clonidine, uh, which is a, a very old blood pressure medication, it's um, known to have this same effect on the alpha-2 receptor. And one computational, so kind of like a, a computer simulation of CBG, uh, predicted it would have a higher affinity at this receptor than clonidine. Now, um, clonidine used to be indicated, well, I guess it still is, as a treatment for blood pressure, but it's probably one of the most commonly used drugs off-label, which means it's used for a lot of other things besides blood pressure, and it's not that great at, at blood pressure. It's, it's got some other targets in the body, and it it's kind of erratic. It can be too strong for blood pressure, not very consistent. But what it's used for a lot is conditions where there's too much fight or flight nervous system activity. And I'm sure that, you know, I, I see a lot of its use in, um, in autism spectrum disorders where there's aggression and agitation. Uh, and and it, it can work quite well in that setting. But really anywhere when the, when the sympathetic nervous system is overstimulated. So it's used in opioid withdrawal. It's, it can be used as a treatment for PTSD or anxiety to settle down that fight or flight system. Um, and then um, there are different subtypes of this alpha-2 receptor and uh, they do different things. And we don't know what CBG does in terms of these different subtypes. So it might be very similar to clonidine or it might be a little bit different. And so um, you know we'll have to learn more about this. But what we do know about this target is that CBG might be useful for treating blood pressure, pain, especially sympathetically mediated pain, attention deficit disorder. There's another drug that acts on this alpha-2 receptor called guanfacine. It, it comes in an extended release and it's approved as a drug for treating ADD and ADHD. It has less blood pressure effects than clonidine. I see that used a lot. Uh, when it works, it's nice because it can be um, an alternative to stimulant medications. Um, CBG might be useful for opiate withdrawal symptoms, tick disorders, PTSD, dementia, and so forth. So, and, and this is a target 
that we don't see a lot of action with the other cannabinoids. So that this is kind of something new. Now, um, looking at the serotonin 5-HT1A receptor, we see, again, something kind of new. CBG is, has been shown to be a neutral antagonist. It, it blocks both agonists and inverse agonists. Uh, and so it, it kind of blocks some of the activity at this receptor. Compared to CBD and CBDA, these are indirect agonists. They, they end up stimulating this receptor. And that's been shown, at least in animal models, to be the mechanism of action behind the anti-nausea effects, uh, the antidepressant, anti-anxiety effects. And so kind of an opposite function between CBG versus CBD and CBDA in this regard. Unlike THC and CBD, CBG has not been found to have anti-emetic or anti-nausea, anti-vomiting effects. And it's also been shown to oppose some of the anti-nausea effects of CBD, which is the little bit of evidence that this theoretical opposition between CBG and CBD might be real. You know, I, I think, you know, I've, I first put it out to the Society of Cannabis Clinicians and to Bonnie, hey, has anybody reported uh, trying to take CBG and CBD together and finding that the CBG cancels out the CBD? And I didn't really hear much, um, much about that. And if any of you uh, watching tonight have had that experience, I'd love to hear about it during the questions session. Uh, but I, I think it's possible that some of the benefits of CBD could be counteracted by enough of CBG. We'll talk more about you know, recommendations that follow from there. Um, now, another really interesting thing is that this 5-HT1A receptor is located both pre and postsynaptically, if you think about that image that was shown before. And the downstream functions of the receptor vary based on what type of neuron it is and where the neuron is. And so it, I know this sounds really counterintuitive, but a selective antagonist of this receptor has been shown to make the effects of an SSRI, the common class of antidepressants that raises serotonin levels, uh, it, makes, it can make it more strong. So I know this sounds strange. How could a, a drug or a, you know, a research molecule that blocks this receptor how could it make it, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor activity stronger? And again, that depends where the receptor is, probably the subtype of the receptor and so forth. Um, another antagonist was found to enhance the effects of several different classes of serotonergic antidepressants in human patients with major depressive disorders. So it's not just animal evidence, there's some human evidence. I know this is getting really confusing, but I, I guess what I'm suggesting here is it's possible that CBG could block some of the benefits of serotonergic agents like CBD or like some antidepressant drugs, but it's also very possible that it could actually enhance and make these effects more potent. And it could depend on the individual, the drug, the, their physiologic situation. So certainly a, a potential for interactions here. Um, probably not dangerous interactions, but interactions that could increase or decrease the effectiveness of a treatment. And so uh, unpredictable effects um, on concurrently administered psychiatric medications and potentially on CBD. This is why I'm suggesting we have a lot more to learn here. Um, now, uh, turning to the inside of the cell, uh, so we're no longer on, on these G-protein coupled receptors on the cell membrane, we're on the nucleus of the cell. Uh, the PPAR gamma nuclear receptor is uh, a, a receptor that controls the expression of genes uh, that are related to metabolism, inflammation, sometimes pain, um, uh, bone remodeling. And, and so uh, this CBG has a stronger affinity to PPAR gamma than both THC and CBD, and therefore has potential to improve symptoms and the pathology of metabolic syndrome. And in one in vivo or um, rodent study, uh, the effects of CBG were enhanced by CBD. The kind of anti-metabolic syndrome effects were enhanced by CBD. So these two could potentially work well together in certain situations. And then CBG has been shown to be an anti-inflammatory. Uh, both CBG and CBGA uh, were shown to inhibit the COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes more powerfully than THC. 
you can see in this graph here, percent inhibition. Now, th these are enzymes that produce inflammatory signals in the body. So when you inhibit the enzymes, there's less inflammation. And you can see uh, the signals down here at the bottom for CBG and CBGA were stronger even than CBDA in terms of COX inhibition um, and uh, stronger than THCA. And we, we tend to think of THCA and CBDA as these strong anti-inflammatory aspects of cannabis perhaps uh, CBG and CBGA are even stronger in some settings, uh, especially related to these two enzymes. And then also not just inflammation in the peripheral tissues, but also inflammation in the central nervous system uh, via its activity in the endocannabinoid system. So we, uh, it's been shown that CBG can inhibit an enzyme called NAAA, which hydrolyzes palmitoyl ethanolamide, PEA, which is an endocannabinoid-like molecule, and it also hydrolyzes other fatty acid ethanolamides. Uh, CBG has also been shown, uh, oh, and so basically inhibiting this enzyme would lead to higher levels of PEA, and PEA has been studied. It's actually available over the counter as a nutraceutical product with anti-inflammatory, anti-pain, and other benefits, um, anti-mast cell activation. Uh, then CBG also inhibits anandamide cellular uptake and the enzyme mag lipase, which breaks down our endocannabinoid 2-AG. And so we've, we've got some indirect activity in the ECS here uh, that could decrease neuroinflammation. CBG has been shown to have antibacterial properties. Uh, it's been, uh, it's among the most potent cannabinoid tested against antibiotic resistant strains of Staph aureus. Compared to in one study, compared to conventional antibiotics, it had a lower minimum inhibitory concentration than the antibiotic norfloxacin in five out of six strains tested. It was more potent than erythromycin, tetracycline, and oxacillin in at least one resistant strain. Uh, so, for something that's so non, you know, seemingly non toxic, uh, that could have these antimicrobial effects, that could be important. And then um, in a mouse model of Staph aureus infection, uh, one study showed that CBG was effective at reducing, as effective at, at reducing colony forming units as vancomycin, which is a strong antibiotic that's used commonly for that type of infection. So um, not just like some antimicrobial properties, but comparable to antibiotics. And then uh, pain. So CBG tip probably works mostly as an analgesic via its activity at that alpha-2 receptor we discussed earlier and via its anti-inflammatory effects, but there's many other targets that can modulate pain listed on this slide, uh, but, um, but not tested. So these are all theoretical. There was one uh, rodent study where CBG was shown to be much more potent than THC and aspirin it was a model of peripheral inflammatory pain. And so here in this uh, bottom of the slide here, you can see the ED50, which is the effective dose in half of the uh, animal subjects at reducing pain. And you can see the, the dosage of CBG was much lower than THC. You know, CBG worked at 1.26 milligrams per kilogram, whereas THC worked at 25. Now, THC reduced pain more. You could keep cranking up the dose of THC and eventually get 100% reduction of pain in this model. Uh, this was the most you could get from CBG, but this occurred at a very low dose, which tells me that, uh, I mean, for rodents, this is very low. So CBG could be a good agent for pain uh, and certainly without the impairment uh, possibility related to THC. And then inflammatory bowel disease. One mouse model of colitis found that CBG uh, was protective and curative and, uh, and that's measured by reducing uh, colon weight and length, uh, the, the ratio of weight to length, which basically tells us how inflamed it is. Um, now, this, this DNBS, this model of colitis, increases uh, some of these inflammatory uh, cytokines and decreases IL-10 levels. CBG restored these to normal levels in the study. So it's, um, it looks like via modulating these inflammatory signals and the way they're produced and the amount of them, it can decrease inflammation and probably not just in the colon. 
uh, CBG restored superoxide dismutase antioxidant protect, uh, protection, which is another mechanism of action for protecting the cells in the intestine. So it could be a lot of promise there for inflammatory bowel disease. And then cancer, uh, like many of the phytocannabinoids, CBG was reported to reduce cell proliferation in many types of cancer. Uh, several findings suggest it may be more relevant for prostate cancer than some of the other phytocannabinoids. I know in the work that came out of Israel a few years ago, where many different types of cannabis were tested against many different types of cancer cells, um, in some of the formulas uh, they found, and this is Deddy Mieri's work, they found that you know different products that had the same amount or almost the same amount of CBD and THC could have very differing effects on the viability of these cancer cells. And probably two of the most common reasons found for those varying effects, one was CBG, another one was THCA, the presence or absence of CBG or THCA. So it might be an important part of cancer treatment. In terms of glaucoma, CBG's chronic and to a lesser extent acute administration has been shown to reduce ocular tension in cats, so the pressure in the eyes. The intraocular pressure of uh, the CBG treated eyes was four to eight millimeters of uh, mercury lower than the untreated eye on the other side. That's a, a pretty significant reduction uh, that could be important, important treatment for glaucoma. And uh, it was shown not to be toxic to the eye or to the optic nerve. And so this is a um, diagram from that uh, textbook uh, that just kind of sums, sums up the mechanisms of action in terms of what we could do with these mechanisms of action. So CBG, as we mentioned, uh, reducing pain and inflammation, having anti-cancer effects, anti-glaucoma, anti-inflammatory bowel uh, disease effects, um, antibacterial for infections, also some evidence suggesting it could um, help with psoriasis, bone healing, neuroinflammation, Testosterone imbalance, it has some weak uh, uh, anti-androgen effects. I don't know that those are going to be uh, clinically relevant, but we'll see. And then also some potential in mood disorders. So that is a quick summary of a lot of different things that CBG does. And um, next, we're going to move into some of the studies. But before I do that, I'm curious, uh, Bonnie, if there's anything you want to comment on or, or Ethan, uh, anything to add at, at this review, this summary? No, uh, excellent summary. Um, it's what's interesting about CBG, which is the same as what we're seeing with CBD and to a lesser extent, some of these other cannabinoids is this, you know, what we call promiscuity not really selective, hits multiple targets, which translated to a clinical application makes it difficult to guess how a patient is going to respond. So that is why when people ask, well, how come it didn't work for me? Or how come it, it um, works great for me, but not for somebody else with the same condition? Um, you have to remember that there's a lot of different targets and your underlying baseline chemistry matters, right? And yeah. so if you don't, and most of us don't really understand our baseline chemistry necessarily on a cellular level. So um, I think when introducing CBG, you do the same thing as you do with everything else. You start low, you titrate up, and you look to see how you feel specifically looking for the desired effects and looking for those effects that maybe aren't so desired and then trying to narrow in on the best dose. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, um, we, we have a lot to learn and um, what we learn is probably gonna be different for different individuals. Um, like most of the other compounds we talk about, THC and CBD included, CBG has the potential to lower blood pressure uh, via this alpha-2 uh, receptor. I'm wondering, Bonnie, because we're not going to talk about it in the subsequent slides, but have you seen that at all clinically, CBG having an effect on blood pressure? Um, no, I have not seen that on, no, I have, I have seen some children with autism get an opposite reaction, but it seems to be that kind of biphasic, bidirectional. They're not at the right dose. Yeah. So uh, sometimes it seems like they're overstimulated at that low dose and then the higher doses are more calming. And again, it depends on the, the person and their underlying chemistry. But no, I haven't seen any issues with blood pressure. Okay. It, it's, I, I keep seeing it come up. And so I suspect that Catherine Fairfield has a very pressing question 
for this part of the webinar instead of uh, later during the question session. And so I'm, I'm open to hear that. I'm going to um, unmute you, Catherine, or ask you to unmute. And um, if your question is relevant to these mechanisms of action, I'm happy to take it now. Or, oh, there you go. Hi. Hi, can we can me? hear you. Yes, we can. Um, I, I'm just, geez, I don't know. <laughs> it, it's a lot of information and um, I'm just trying to um, figure out how to get my, my pain from my back surgery, um, which seems to be muscle related, um, a doctor told me that I had to see. Um, with one certain um, tincture be better than another? Yeah, okay. So, um, you know, a, a, a complex question uh, because, you know, pain comes from different sources and different, even, even two people that have similar types of pain might respond differently to two different treatments. You know, I think still I'm suspecting that THC is going to be the best pain reliever that the cannabis plant has to offer, especially milligram per milligram. Uh, and that's in general, but I think that some people do well with uh, more of the anti-inflammatory compounds like CBD, A, THCA. Some people do well with CBD for pain, even though I think that's a lot less common. Um, and, and then CBG, I think, is, a, is something new to try. So if we you know, work to kind of get you fine-tuned in terms of your THC and CBD dosing, and uh, you weren't satisfied with that, it might make sense to do a trial of CBG. And kind of like Bonnie said, starting low and going slow and seeing how it affected you. I think it does hit pain targets that are distinct from CBD and THC, certainly. Okay, um, so can you take two uh, tinctures together? Like, um, would it make sense to take um, just a little bit of the THC and and the CBD? And, um, yeah, I, I well, think right I, now what I have right now is um, CBD A. Yeah. Um, so mixing those two does that sound? Yeah, I, th I think that that I think that um, using THC and CBDA together, and then if, if you weren't satisfied with the results and wanted to see if you could get more pain relief, I think that it would um, make sense in some cases to add CBG to that. I'm, I'm curious if, if you have any comments on that, Bonnie, but um, or, or Ethan, but um, or if you've got any experience with people doing that. I often, you know, how the way I practice is very methodically. You start with one, you ramp up dosing, you see if you can find your best spot. Then you, if you find something that helps, you find the best dose, then you add something else if you, there's still room for improvement. Same thing, start low, titrate up, see if you can find a sweet spot where you get both, right? And if something is not helpful at low and high, you jettison it put it on the back burner, maybe come back around to it at a later date, a different chemovar, a different product within that uh, group. So I'm, I'm very methodical. You have to take notes, so you should be journaling. And also it would be helpful if you had somebody helping you who understands these compounds. But the other thing is that it takes time. Yeah, thank I, you. That's really good advice, Bonnie. I appreciate that. Does okay. Yeah. I'd like to Thank jump you. in if I could real quick. Please. About the nausea issue, the possibility of CBD, uh, CBG complicating the antiemetic effect of CBD. Um, in our survey, uh, we had a high level of endorsement for CBG improving nausea um, and actually uh, better than in comparison with conventional drugs. So at least so far, um, I know a lot of these preparations that were used were likely mixed, CBD, CBG. Um, so far, we haven't seen this problem in humans. Uh, the study that was cited was an animal study, and you know it, it could be that things are quite different. Um, but so far, so good on that issue. Yeah, I, I, you know, amongst colleagues, I really wasn't able to find anyone with like 
at even one case that thought that CBG counteracted CBD. And, and at the end of this presentation, we'll look at some uh, cases of Parkinson's and dementia where they seem to work well together as well. So it, it's kind of a theoretical idea that they might work against each other. And I agree, probably they don't. Um, it might be interesting for people that are adding CBG to try both spacing it apart from their CBD or CBDA and taking them at the same time and seeing if they notice a difference there. And that might be like a four hour window, you know, like take, take one, wait four hours, take another and compare how that feels versus taking them together. Um, but I'm curious, I, we have a lot more to learn about that. Um, Ethan, okay. any comments on this strange, like uh, 5-HT1A antagonist potentiating well, serotonergic drugs? Um, I'm not going to claim to understand it. Uh, what you said was exactly right. There's seemingly these paradoxical effects. And, you know, the idea of counteracting 5-HT1A sounds bad, but it, in practice, um, we're only seeing good things in this regard. So um, I can't explain what's going on at a neurophysiological level, but so far it seems all good. Okay, very good. Well, let's move on to some of the newer research. And so uh, to begin with, this is an uh, interesting study. I, I put it first because I, I found it surprising. And it, again, this is an animal model. A lot of these animal models do not translate to people, especially people that are taking uh, multiple compounds that can work synergistically together. Um, but this is a, basically a model of PTSD in mice. It assesses the effects of repeated, uh, well, well, in this study, they assess the effects of re re repeated CBG exposure on long-term fear memories, uh, looking at the expression of these fear memories, the acquisition of them. So like, um, you know, uh, just to put this into terms of PTSD, uh, how traumatizing is this experience? Does it create this fear memory that affects behavior moving forward? That would be acquisition. And then how strongly does it impact that behavior? Uh, that would be the expression. Uh, consolidation has to do with when they have this traumatic experience, how likely are they or how quickly do they kind of consolidate that into their long-term memory storage? How, how is it made a part of their uh, memories. And then reconsolidation would mean like if they're re-exposed to a cue or a trigger or re-traumatized, uh, does that fear memory get enhanced? And, and so there's animal models of this where basically a mouse is put into a cage and, and shocked in its feet. I'll, I'll show you how that works in subsequent slides. Um, but basically this is a model that has shown both THC and CBD to be effective in some of these measures, basically having anti-PTSD effects. And it's not just anti-anxiety effects, it's um, dis it, CBD and THC have been shown to disrupt the process of acquiring PTSD, and in some cases to speed the healing of PTSD or the fear extinction. So, um, so this is how it works. And, and this was uh, this was the first test that was described on long-term fear memory. And so basically what this little diagram shows is that the mouse is put in a cage with a wire bottom. Uh, it receives a shock through the, through the cage floor. Um, 12 hours later, it starts receiving CBG. It receives CBG daily for 21 days. Uh, then 72 hours go by to make sure the CBG isn't still in the system. And then the mouse is put back into the same cage and they look at does the mouse freeze up when put back into that same cage if it freezes up this is an indication that it remembers how painful this cage was 20 you know five days ago or whatever and um and so you can uh see here uh that the percent freezing uh, so, so this is a control group that didn't get the shock no shock and vehicle this is shock and vehicle uh, and you can see if they froze about 40%, so no CBG was administered. And then in this one, 10 milligrams per kilogram of CBG administered, and in this one, a higher dose, 30 milligrams per kilogram. And what you can see here is there was, there was no change. CBG did not change this retrieval of the long-term fear memory, even after 21 days of treatment. No change in that in that test. Here's one on uh, fear memory acquisition. So the CBG is given before the shock, two hours before the shock, the rodent shocked, 24 hours later, it's put back in the cage. How often does it freeze? 
you can see here there was no significant difference at any of these three doses of CBG. So CBG didn't seem to change fear memory acquisition either. Another study looking at fear memory consolidation. So the rodent is shocked, it immediately receives CBG, and then 24 hours later, it's put back in the cage and uh, see, uh, looked at how much it freezes. So this is testing, well, if we give the CBG right after the trauma, does it prevent that consolidation or that long-term storage of this traumatic memory? In this model, again, the answer was no. CBG at three different doses didn't really seem to do anything. And then as far as uh, reconsolidation, so the rodent is shocked. Uh, 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 the next day, CBG is given two hours before putting it back in the cage. So this is how, how able is it to retrieve the memory of being shocked yesterday. And CBG, again, did not change that at all. It didn't make it any less likely for the rodent to freeze up and, and therefore uh, you know, didn't change the retrieval of the fear memory. And then kind of a different model here uh, using the light dark uh, box, uh, this is looking at anxiety. So the rodent is shocked, 24 hours later, it's given CBG and then put into this cage where it can spend time in the light or spend time in the dark. And I'm not gonna uh, go into detail about all of this, but essentially it didn't change anything. It didn't change the trauma related uh, anxiety behavior of the mouse either. And so, uh, yeah, let's pause here and, and talk about CBG and um, PTSD. Now, again, this is just an animal model. I think humans with PTSD are way more complex and might have um, more aberrant uh, autonomic nervous system activity that CBG could potentially help with, you know, compared to a rodent. Uh, but but the, this uh, study at least suggests that CBG is different than THC and CBD when it comes to uh, trauma and trauma-related anxiety. Um, any comments on that, Bonnie, or have you seen anybody uh, using P um, CBG for PTSD symptoms? I have not treated anybody with PTSD for, uh, with CBG. I find the best results usually either THC or CBD or a combination thereof. Um, and after this, I probably uh, would think twice again before doing it, but certainly somebody who might have a treatment resistant uh, to THC and CB, uh, CBD, I would try it only because I have seen uh, many patients uh, with anxiety do well with CBG. Yep. Okay, thank you. Let's, let's move on. Uh, this next one is about CBGA. And uh, the author started, uh, again, so this is the acidic precursor to CBG. It gets converted into CBG when it's heated. And so in this study, um, and, and by the way, I've presented many studies in, in the last year webinars uh, from this group. It's a group in Australia that's really listening uh, to clinicians like Bonnie and myself and has been very interested in the acidic cannabinoids and uh, different approaches using cannabis to treat uh, epilepsy in, in their animal models. And so they first screened several of these minor cannabinoids in mouse models of Dravet syndrome, which is a severe seizure disorder. They looked at, at all the ones you see here on the slide, um, and they found some promising results with CBGA. They took that further and then tested it in two other seizure models, one called the maximal electroshock model, and then the six hertz threshold uh, model, um, and then also tested for spontaneous seizures in the Dravet model. Uh, the first Dravet model has to do with temperature. The second one is just looking at spontaneous seizures. And, um, and then they looked at the targets of CBGA. And, and so this brought some new information that I think is, uh, is worthwhile. So uh, first of all, this is the screen of all these different minor cannabinoids in this um, uh, Dravet model. And basically they raise the temperature of the rodent. The rodent has a, a genetic change that affects this sodium receptor and uh, sodium channel. And, and as the animal gets hotter and hotter, eventually it's gonna have a seizure at a certain temperature. And if it's able to withstand higher temperatures, that means that the agent might have more strong anti-epileptic effects. And so you can see over here, um, uh, they make it a little hard. Each, each cannabinoid has three bars, right, at, at three different doses. So you can see CBDV, for example, had some anti-convulsant activity at the medium dose, 
but not at the low or the high dose, not significant anyways, which is interesting. CBDVA had anti-convulsant properties at a very high dose, 100 milligrams per kilogram. CBG didn't have any in this model. CBGA had anti-convulsant properties both at 30 and 100 and, and so forth down the line. Um, THCV actually had some pro-convulsant effects at a certain dose. Uh, a lot of you are probably you know, curious to see, well, the same agent, the same cannabinoid at one dose can make seizures worse and one dose can make seizures better. Well, welcome to cannabis. That's uh, you know, pretty normal, actually, even though it seems abnormal. Uh, in this model, in a previous study, CBD was effective at 100 milligrams per kilogram. And so you can see CBGA, at least in this model, seems to be more potent because it was effective at 30 milligrams per kilogram. And that's why the researchers became interested in it and did some further studies. So um, that was temperature-induced seizures. The next thing they looked at was spontaneous seizures. And um, they gave uh, CBGA in two different ways. One injected into the abdomen, IP, uh, at three different doses. And then the other was just added to their food at a, at a fairly high dose, uh, but the expectation is that less is absorbed by eating it versus having it injected. And so you can see it's a much, much higher dose added. Um, they also looked at the blood levels of CBGA and found that uh, to get the equivalent of 100 milligrams per kilogram injected, they needed 2,500 milligrams per kilogram in the chow. And so you, those achieved similar blood levels and in theory, similar brain levels, even though we're not that they didn't test that. Um, looking at the seizure frequency, uh, again, these are spontaneous seizures. It seems like uh, the high dose of CBGA resulted in more spontaneous seizures, not less, an unexpected finding. Uh, the low dose was not significantly different from the untreated animals, but those that received the high dose of CBGA on average had more seizures you can see there were fewer of them that had zero seizures in the high dose uh, treatment group. And then the other thing that was kind of surprising is that the animals that were treated with CBGA at both doses had less survival. More of them died. Uh, and you can see a pretty steep drop off here after about three weeks of treatment. So, um, you know, some warnings there, CBGA might not be great uh, in some uh, types of seizures. And, um, you know, I think in, in human patients, people would probably notice that and not necessarily continue the treatment if it were making things worse. So I'm not suggesting uh, this is going to be killing uh, uh, patients with epilepsy, uh, but it's, it's still interesting to note that this was the effect in this one model, just one model of one severe type of seizure disorder, and this cannot be generalized to all types of seizures. CBGA uh, was shown to increase the anticonvulsant efficacy of Clobazam, uh, brand name is Onfi, uh, against thermally induced seizures and spontaneous seizures. So this is a common drug that's used in Dravet syndrome. It is a um, atypical benzodiazepine, and so it works uh, via the GABA signaling system. And because CBGA is a GABA reuptake inhibitor, it may be potentiating this drug. Uh, the way that to read these is, again, here we're at temperature uh, and seizure uh, occurrence. And you can see that when uh, Clobazam was given on its own, it raised the temperature threshold a little bit. When CBGA was given, it didn't change the temperature threshold much, but when they were given together, you see the best results. Um, over, so that was temperature-related seizures. Here are the spontaneous seizures. And again, in the combination treatment, you can see the, they're clustering much lower. That was statistically significant and no real difference in survival amongst the three groups. And then changing models, the maximal electroshock model, um, CBGA had a biphasic anticonvulsant effects where at just the right dose, it did raise the threshold for seizures. So it had an anticonvulsant effect, but at too low of a dose and too high of a dose, it didn't do anything. You know, go, it just, it's just so strange, but it's, it's pretty common. So I'm, I'm used to it now. Uh, so a different seizure model, maybe the right dose of CBGA helpful. And then in the six hertz seizure model, 
two doses of CBGA were shown to be pro-convulsant, making seizures worse, whereas the higher dose did not make seizures worse. Yes, I mean, th these are really their findings. Uh, uh, head scratchers, but something is happening at the lower doses that, that isn't happening at the higher doses. Strange. Um, so what else did they find? Well, they looked at the mechanisms of action and they showed that CBGA is a non-competitive antagonist of GPR55 at concentrations that are relevant to the brain. Now, this is thought to be one of the anticonvulsant targets of CBD. Mm -hmm. So potentially CBGA and maybe CBG, they didn't test it, but uh, CBGA might be acting similar to CBD in terms of seizures. CBGA uh, showed the positive allosteric modulation of GABA-A. So it's not just a reuptake inhibitor, but it's actually making the activity at that receptor stronger. Um, this probably is uh, another part of its uh, synergy with the drug clobazam. Prolonged exposure to CBGA in their studies resulted in the down or not down regulation, but desensitization of this receptor, which would potentially explain um, how uh, a high dose uh, could um, kind of diminish the therapeutic benefit. Basically, if you desensitize the receptor, it might not be active anymore. And so maybe too much of it uh, if it's too strong, it kind of backfires. Uh, CBGA also showed inhibition of TRPV1, but not likely at relevant concentrations. So um, that's, uh, let, let's let that kind of kick off our conversation on CBGA and maybe CBG also in terms of uh, seizures. Now, I've, um, see, I'm pretty new to CBG. You know, I haven't been using it with my patients much. I've had one case so far that uh, seem to be pretty dialed in with CBD and THCA. I suggested, um, and, the, and the, the child, I think, gosh, he's about 12 now. Uh, he was still having infrequent seizures. He had gotten a lot better on these other two agents. I had suggested adding CBG as more of an approach for his behavior, which was hyperactive and somewhat agitated. And um, it turns out that after adding CBG, the seizures went away completely. That's my, that's my one case of anticonvulsant effects with CBG. Uh, what about you, Bonnie? That's funny. I have a very similar story, a teenager uh, with a longstanding history of seizures who had a significant reduction of seizures with uh, CBD and low-dose THC and low-dose THCA, but still was having, I would say she went from probably around 50, 60 seizures a month down to maybe 10. And we added CBG to help with kind of the breakthrough behaviors to see if it would help with anxiety, despite being on all these other compounds. It just tells you how neuro excitatory her brain was, but adding CBG, she's the only patient. We saw another 75% reduction of seizures, um, which is always very hard to explain. Is it because the product had maybe a terpene in it that might help her? Is it the CBG? It's, it's hard to explain. Um, but she had that result. I have not seen uh, seizure reduction with the addition of CBG in any other patient who still was having, you know, who's been on uh, cannabinoids for seizures um, and still had room for improvement. So adding, uh, it's not what I go to. I go to it for behavior and anxiety, but uh, because of that one case, it is still on the list and I will still add it in once we kind of get through the other cannabinoids. Thank you. All right. Any other comments about seizures and these compounds, Ethan? Yeah, sure. Um, CBGA, no comment, but uh, boy, I, I'd be real hesitant after seeing the animal data. With CBG in our survey, we only had a few people that commented and it uh, wasn't statistically significant. So um, I don't think it would be a go-to agent in this instance, but it has plenty more to recommend it. Great, thanks. All right, let's move on uh, to another study. And this is looking at uh, cancer cells, specifically uh, glioblastoma cells. And so um, uh, su the title, as you can see, suggests that CBG is a potential therapeutic agent in this type of cancer. I, um, I had a, a new patient with glioblastoma today and also a new one last week. Um, it is the, um, so what can we say about glioblastoma? It is the most um, common, it's one of the most aggressive cancers and also one of the most common types of brain cancer. 
And the standard therapy for it, which is radiation plus temozolomide, uh, typically only prolongs survival by about two months. It's a, it's a very deadly cancer uh, because um, for a couple of reasons, the tumor itself tends to have these glioblastoma stem cells inside of it. And so those are highly resistant to our current treatment. And so even if the treatment kills the cancer, these, uh, these cancer stem cells can then create new cancer and, and actually cancer that's adapted to the treatment. The other part of um, this being such a, a difficult type of cancer to treat is the way it invades the brain. Uh, really, really gets in there and is very hard to remove it completely using surgery. So um, other animal studies have, and, and some human data, has shown that THC, CBD, and combinations of the two have anti-glioblastoma effects. Uh, no previous testing with CBG on this type of cancer. So this is the first study that's looked at that. Uh, they were using pure cannabinoids, not, um, not whole plant type uh, preparations using uh, established research-based glioblastoma cell lines. And then also they obtained about a dozen uh, cell lines from individual patients. And I think that you know, adds to the, um, how informative this is, because uh, again, with these uh, glioblastoma stem cells, um, there's, uh, the, the cancers can be very different from one patient to the next, even though it's the same type of cancer. And they did the test both on the uh, differentiated cancer cells and also on the glioblastoma stem cells. So um, let's just dig right into the results. Uh, basically, the viability of both the glioblastoma cells and the uh, stem cells were significantly reduced by all three of the cannabinoids. CBD was the strongest. And so you can see uh, what, the, what these numbers are showing are the concentration required to uh, kill or prevent life in about half of the cells present. And so you can see the average required for CBG was 28 micromolar, for CBD 22 micromolar, and THC uh, 27. So pretty similar, but CBD was the most potent. And then looking at the stem cells, uh, you can see again uh, that CBD was the most potent, CBG was less potent there. So it definitely had some anti-cancer activity, but not quite as strong as the others. Um, for those of you that are curious, it's the U87 and U373 and the K26 that are kind of the standard research cell lines and all these NIB ones are the ones they um, derive from uh, patients' biopsies. So um, that was cell viability. Then they were also, uh, the CBG was also tested on um, cytostatic effects. So this isn't about killing cancer, it's just about preventing cancer from dividing and growing, from preventing the cells uh, from replicating. And, and what the study looked at is how uh, the percentage of cells that remained in this G1 or S phase versus G2 and M. And so I'm gonna explain that a little bit uh, using this diagram. After a cell divides, not just cancer cells, but any cells, after it divides, it goes through this first growth phase called G1. Then it goes through an S phase where its DNA is being replicated. So it's kind of doubling its DNA. Then it goes through another growth phase after that, which is followed by the cell division. And then it starts over again. And so if a higher percentage of the cancer cells get stuck in G1 or S, that's a good thing. They get stuck there. It means they're not going to continue and divide. And, and what the study showed in three of the different cell lines, uh, this is, on the left is the vehicle and on the right is CBG at 25 micromolar, uh, which is you know, similar to the concentration needed to uh, decrease viability. There was a, a shift in the amount of cells that got stuck in the G1 phase. You can see 64% to 85%, 51 to 67, and 61 to 76, suggesting that CBG at the same concentration where it can decrease the viability of the cells in other cells, it could also prevent it from dividing and prevent the tumor from growing. They also looked at um, apoptosis, which is a, a closer look at how it's doing this. Is it causing these cancer cells to kind of self-destruct? Uh, another thing, you know, that, that's better. It creates less uh, damage and less inflammation in the body, uh, better than necrosis, which would be just the cell kind of dying and spilling its contents uh, and making a mess uh, for the body to clean up. Uh, similar results to, to THC and CBD, if you look at uh, CBG. Um, but 
uh, the uh, glioblastoma stem cells were more sensitive than the glioblastoma cells. And this suggests that uh, CBG's impact on the viability is probably largely due to its effect on these stem cells. Um, and that's, that's important because these stem cells are highly resistant to treatment. And so if we have a non-toxic agent uh, that can um, you know, cause apoptosis in these stem cells, that could be very important. Uh, also in this study, it was shown that adding uh, CBG or TMZ, which is temozolomide, it's the uh, standard treatment, the standard chemotherapy treatment for this type of cancer, uh, adding those to CBG in, enhanced its uh, apoptotic effects. So, um, and, and you can, the other thing I think worth pointing out on the slide is we've got four different types of glioblastoma, you know, all the same type of cancer, but just four different cell lines. And look at how different the effects were. I mean, CBG caused apoptosis in almost 50% of this one and uh, just about zero of this one. So it could really differ from one person to the next and one cancer uh, cell line to the next. Okay, and then um, we're not gonna go real deep into this image here, but uh, the combined effects. So looking at combining CBD and CBG at different doses, what they found was that there were additive effects, not synergistic, not like multiplicative, but uh, additive in both the glioblastoma uh, cells and the stem cells. Um, the uh, viability of the stem cells increased at very low concentrations below one, uh, excuse me, below 10 micromolar for CBD and five micromolar for CBG. Interesting, you know, so at higher concentrations, it decreased viability, but at lower concentrations, it seemed to stimulate viability. That's a bad thing, right? We don't want to enhance the viability of these stem cells. Um, the authors suggested based on a previous study um, that it's possible that what's happening is the cannabinoids are increasing the differentiation, meaning the conversion of stem cells into mature differentiated cancer cells. Uh, and that that's, that's part of what's kind of confounding these results and showing that it's increasing the viability because it's driving that uh, differentiation process. Hard to know, but I, I like to point it out. You know, we see, we have all this data showing, wow, it looks like CBG and its uh, companions in cannabis are really bad for these types of cancer. And maybe it, they do things that the traditional treatments can't do. And maybe they're enhanced by the traditional treatments and perhaps in the wrong situation at the wrong dose, it could make, or the right situation, the right dose, it could make things worse, right? Maybe it could actually enhance the survival of the cancer. There's just so many unknowns. Um, THC and temozolomide had modest benefits and also sometimes had antagonistic effects when added to the combinations of CBD and CBG, uh, but they didn't do that when added to the optimized combination. So what that means is the researchers tested all these different combinations of CBG and CBD, when they, when they um, had the optimized, the best combination, and then they added THC or added temozolomide, it seemed to enhance the benefits. But in other situations where they weren't using the optimized combination, adding THC or temozolomide in some cases decreased the cancer killing ability. Again, you know, it's, there's just so many unknowns. We are so far from taking this data and knowing how it applies to our patients. You know, are we getting these concentrations in the brain and what are the optimized concentrations? There's just so many unknowns here. But I, you know, I think for now the take home message is that CBG could be providing additional anti-cancer effects in some people at the right dose. And, and I know that's a lot, uh, a big stretch from knowing exactly how to practice clinically with this. Um, CBG was shown to inhibit invasion, meaning the tumor invading the brain more um, uh, and more powerfully than CBD. And then low concentration CBG was shown to be more effective than the highest concentration of temozolomide when it comes to uh, inhibiting invasion of the brain. So, wow, lots of, oh, and then, and then another thing that is a little bit off topic here, but they, these researchers also published this in the study. They looked at these you know, remember they had this huge variety of cancer cell lines from d different patients uh, that seemingly responded differently to the cannabinoids. And so what they did was test, do these cancer cell lines have CB1 and CB2 receptors? Yes, they all had both CB1 and CB2, um, but uh, the expression was pretty different. 
Uh, some had a lot, some had a little. And again, this suggests that uh, we should expect large patient variability in their response to cannabinoids. Wow, lots there for uh, CBG and cancer. Before we move on, any comments? Uh, so I have a comment. Um, one is great review of a very complex paper. This paper has a huge amount of information in it. So thank you for that. Uh, it really helps, Dustin. And then the other thing that I wanted to say is we know that glioblastoma multiforme is, has dismal outcome. And I certainly think, and we know GW is doing research with the CBD THC combination with temozolomide. It is time to start doing clinical trials with CBG and CBD. It, it's how long do we continue to lose people to this awful beast? So I think it's time with this information. It is complex. And I understand that we're going to have people who may not respond, but ultimately, this is deadly and very quick, quickly deadly. So I do think it's time to start doing some clinical trials. Thank you. Yeah, hard when, um, when you look at the efficacy of our best treatment right now, um, you know, two months of more survival and, 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 you know, that means five days of radiation a week for six weeks, plus an oral chemotherapy agent buying somebody an extra two months on average, that's, that's not very promising. And I, you know, we've seen um, uh, animal studies, case reports, some human studies of CBD and THC actually um, killing the cancer. I've had patients, not many, um, gosh, two that I can recall that have used really high doses of cancer and halted the growth of a glioblastoma for a prolonged period of time. So it doesn't work for everyone. I promise you that. But in some people, it does seem to work uh, in combination or not in combination with, with conventional treatment. And starting earlier rather than starting later. That's, that's a big difference as well. I, I think the other thing that's important to note is that several studies have shown that uh, THC and CBD can have protective effects when it comes to radiation, like protecting the healthy cells from damage mm -hmm. and also sensitizing the cancer cells to the damaging effects of the radiation. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the synergy with temozolomide. So it's like, like agreeing with you, Bonnie, yes, uh, <laughs> it, it makes perfect sense, especially for people that want something as an adjunct to conventional treatment, even though there's a tiny bit of data that suggests doing it wrong might get you the opposite result you're looking for. I think there's much more data that's suggesting uh, we're gonna get more benefits if we add these in with the conventional therapy. Now, I think uh, Rebecca, Abraham has uh, uh, a question pertinent to this topic. So go ahead, I Rebecca. Do. I'm so excited. It's a real honor to ask a question in this crowd. Um, so I am a registered nurse and I actually am getting my doctoral uh, practice doctorate uh, in bridging the gaps between the cannabis industry and traditional healthcare. So this is all really fascinating to me. Um, my business partner um, are two physicians that do primarily oncology hospital medicine at a large academic institution. And when we read through some of the studies, because we help a lot of folks with palliative with symptom control, because like Dr. Goldstein said, these patients have a really poor prognosis and there's really not a lot to lose trying at least cannabis for symptom control. And maybe there's some other positive benefits. Um, and my medical partners joked that if this were a chemotherapy by a pharmaceutical company that increased the mortality, like we saw in earlier CBD studies and CBG studies, they would have pushed this chemotherapy out. Um, do you also kind of feel like that's true? And is this actually hindered more because it's cannabis and schedule one more than they're worried about how it works? And my second kind of tail question is, um, does CBG work better than CBD in some of these cases um, because of the bioavailability? Because they both cross the blood brain barrier, but it seems like the bioavailability of CBG is significantly higher sometimes than CBD. Yeah, great questions. I, well, the first question I wasn't, I didn't understand perfectly. So the question is, are we 
kind of assuming that these are good compounds to use as an adjunct of treatment just because they're from cannabis, even though if they were from something else, we might not give them the same attention? Well, uh, sort of like that, but kind of the opposite. Like um, in clinical trials and pharmaceuticals, all they have to prove is kind of better than placebo and better than the drugs that came before, which isn't actually a very high bar. It's not kind of the high bar we think it is. Um, and when we were looking at kind of the various studies of CBD and CBG, um, the physicians laughed because they said, ah, if this, if you saw a, any kind of chemotherapy that extended the lifespan of somebody 18 months, you would have seen this pushed out already. Like mm -hmm. they kind of wondered like, why not cannabis? Like where it's not as kind of um, damaging to other cells as chemotherapy. Sure. Plus there's actually like a therapeutic symptom relief happening at the same time. Got it. Yeah. So I, I mean, I think, um, cannabis carries some bias, you know, so, uh, against it, but I think what it really comes down to is just the money. You know, if this can be uh, monetized, it's going to be brought to market a lot quicker than if it can't be. And, and probably, um, CBG is harder to monetize than some novel, uh, chemical that they've right. created in a lab that can, that could have similar results, but that that's an interesting comment that you shared. Uh, the question about bioavailability, I'm not sure that, I'm, that I've seen that CBG is more bioavailable per se than CBD. Correct me if I'm wrong, it might be, um, but uh, it seems to be more potent, uh, you know, based on when people are using it, say for anxiety, they might need fewer milligrams of CBG than they do of CBD or something like that. But uh, I'm curious, uh, Bonnie, if you have any comments. I would defer to Ethan on that. Bioavailability, Ethan, any ideas? Ethan might've stepped out. We just got his uh, static image there. Oh, okay. um, no, or I mean, maybe we don't know. Oh, hey. Yeah, I, I don't think we really know uh, that well yet um, on that. Um, uh, however, it, certainly it's uh, seemingly effective in much lower milligram doses than CBD for most things. Um, so I, I wouldn't worry too much. It seems to be getting in on helping people with a lot of different conditions. Yep. Uh, Dustin, can I make just one comment about a clinical Please. case? So I years ago, I treated a gentleman who had glioblastoma multiforme. He um, had the first tumor resected, started CBD oil, and then shortly after, I'd say four to five months, had a recurrence at that time. Um, he went and had surgery and I saw him very shortly after the second surgery where we added in high dose uh, THC. So I had him on pretty high doses of CBD and THC. He was a person who could tolerate the very high doses. He lived for another five and a half years, completely symptom-free and tumor-free. He decided to go climb a mountain with his son in Europe and stopped his cannabis oil and the tumor came back within about five weeks. Um, so remember these stem cells are there. Maybe we're just controlling them, keeping them, uh, latent and quiet and when at any opportunity. So I know Ethan often includes this in his talks. The idea that cancer's completely gone is sometimes not, uh, not true. And so there, those stem cells can be very difficult. And that's why this Study was very exciting to me because they addressed the stem cell, uh, the glioblastoma stem cell question. But I recommend to patients who have cancer who get to a point of NED, remember you may have cells lurking. Uh, don't stop your cannabis. I have other yeah, cases it, as well. Yeah. Thank you. And even the stem cells, I mean, they were not completely eradicated. They were just, you know, partially eradicated. I, I had a similar case, Bonnie, of um, someone that was controlling GBM with uh, mostly just THC. And he simply, uh, he, he had about a year and a half of stable disease. He um, felt like 10 years younger. He loved his high dose THC. It was quite high, about 2000 milligrams per day. Uh, he cut his dose in half and the cancer came back. Uh, so, you know, whenever I see somebody with an aggressive cancer have success with cannabis, I don't want to change anything. I know that, um, you know, people might not want to stay on this treatment for the rest of their lives, but that's, um, and, and once it came back, there was no stopping it, you know, it just came back very aggressively. Yeah. Um, and, and probably some of you are wondering what 2000 milligrams of THC a day, how the heck is that possible? 
It was. He worked up to it gradually. He was taking it all by mouth, uh, just dividing it into uh, three times daily. He didn't. He was never high or impaired. He had built tolerance to all of those effects of THC. He said his joints felt better. He had more energy. Literally, he he kept saying that he felt ten years younger on that dose of THC. It's just amazing. You you never know. Okay, but I guess uh, we're, we're spreading out the webinar and taking questions throughout, but they're such good questions. I see that Susie has raised her hand. I'm sure it's relevant to this topic. So I'm gonna um, unmute you, Susie, and uh, go ahead with your question. Thank you so much. Um, this is absolutely amazing. So I actually wanted to ask, and if you're gonna cover this later, please just say we'll cover it later. Uh, my question was around uh, dementia and any studies on, on dementia, but also um, two other areas that I'm very intrigued by for CVG, um, one around tumors, whether they're cancerous or not, like fibroids, abnormal growth, thyroid nodules, if there's any information around that, um, if, it, if the studies haven't been done, that's fine, I'll, I'll look elsewhere. And um, like it could be fibroids or something like that, but also the other part of, of ALS, has there, in, has there any information that's related to CBG versus CBD on ALS treatment? So dementia and ALS are the two bigger ones and then anything in the women's health space. And if okay. this is not the time for it, just push me aside. That's all right. Well, we will talk about dementia later on, dementia and Parkinson's with CBG. And it's the, the only data that I'm aware of um, I think there was a little bit in, in the study that Ethan published, but I, I don't think it was a big signal there. Um, and then as far as cannabis and non-cancerous tumors, I am not aware of much information that suggests it would be useful uh, for that. Um, but uh, you know, maybe, maybe historically some, but I haven't seen much like pituitary adenomas, um, fibroids. I haven't seen, I haven't seen much, um, uh, in terms of cannabis helping with that clinically or in the literature. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I've been uh, doing CBD. I've been using CBD for a couple of years now, shrinking my fibroids with them along with a couple of other uh, things in my protocol. And that's why I was curious if CBG would work synergistically with that or not, but okay. thank you. Yeah, now, and in terms of um, fibroids, right, there's there's a, a strong hormonal component there. Uh, it could be an inflammatory component there, a, a metabolic influence that affects the hormones. And, you know, these compounds affect all of these different things. So it could very well indirectly uh, be helping shrink the fibroids. And I'm totally open to the idea that it's directly acting on the fibroids also. It's, it's hard to know. Um, but I think the idea is how can we use cannabis to make a person as healthy as possible with an individualized treatment and then uh, see the healing system at work, you know, uh, restoring things back into balance. Well, thank you. Great question. Okay, let's, um, let's move on now to um, where are we going next? Oh, we are going to anti-inflammatory effects. And I'm just going to cover this briefly. It wasn't a very in-depth study. Uh, looked at purified CBG and or CBD in a guinea pig model of lung inflammation. Uh, they compared oral dosing and injection. And then for the oral dosing, they compared, oh, well, for, yeah, for the oral dosing, they compared the MCT oil carrier versus this micellar solution, which was made from a polyoxyl uh, 35 castor oil, something called cremophore. Um, and so uh, the results of inflammation were measured in terms of the number of neutrophil cells that accumulated in the lung tissues of these guinea pigs. Um, and you can see here, CBD did not really change the number of neutrophils at all, um, when, both when given by mouth in MCT oil, but when given, uh, well, yeah, I'll say it didn't change anything when given by mouth in MCT oil, but when given at higher doses in this um, uh, Krell solution, it did actually reduce the, the neutrophils. And so it seemed like to get uh, CBD, at least at these doses into the lungs in a significant quantity, it needed a special carrier, just regular MCT oil, as far as these guinea pigs were concerned, you know, wasn't enough. Um, and then they, so they did inject the MCT oil solution, uh, that didn't do anything. But when they injected the Krell solution, 
again, CBD had a stronger effect based in the solution. Very interesting that giving it by mouth was stronger than giving it by injection at the same doses. You can see that 50 milligrams per kilogram by mouth had a pretty strong reduction in neutrophils. Uh, so this is curious. You know, Most of the time we would expect an injection uh, to be stronger than taking it by mouth, but that may not be the case when given in some of these carriers. Uh, so then turning and looking at CBG, no effect in MCT oil when given by mouth, strong effect or, or moderately strong effect when given in this Krell solution by mouth, um, giving it in the Krell solution by injection did not work at all, not in a significant way. So, so again, CBG seemed to reduce in lung inflammation in this model, but um, needed to be given in a special carrier by mouth. So what are my cells? You know, this, this solution is a surfactant, basically, kind of like a soap. Uh, that reduces surface tension and improves the dissolution of lipophilic fat-loving drugs in watery uh, solutions like we find in the body typically by forming these little, these little balls called micelles. They entrap the drugs within them. So you've got kind of the uh, fat-soluble, fat-loving internal and the water-loving external. And micelles can be made in reverse order also depending on their purpose. Um, but this is, this is what the surfactant does. Uh, these little balls are much easier for the body to absorb and in incorporate into the cells uh, than, than just a regular oil carrier. And so in uh, the, oh, and then the combination, there was no evidence of synergistic effects of combined CBG and CBD. So that it didn't seem like they had synergistic or additive anti-inflammatory properties when tested. Uh, and so the conclusion is that CBD and CBG have significant anti-inflammatory activity in the lung, uh, but that formulation is critical to delivering an effective dose of these agents. And just uh, an interesting finding uh, that in guinea pigs, uh, using this uh, micellar delivery was really strong by mouth, even stronger than injection. Okay, any comments on uh, lung inflammation or surfactants or any of that stuff? Nope, not for okay. me. <laughs> okay. okay, let's move on. Uh, the last study is a series of uh, patients, uh, standardized extracts enriched in CBD and CBG, real world experience of cases in Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia. This was not published uh, in a peer reviewed journal yet. It's been submitted. I found it on ResearchGate. It looked interesting. And so I thought I'd include it. We usually wait for um, peer review publication before covering uh, papers in this um, in this format, but I, I wanted to get everything that was new and interesting about CVG, and I certainly found this new and interesting. So, 14 patients with Parkinson's, five with Lewy body dementia. Uh, there were four formulations that the clinicians had to choose from. One, and again, these are not kind of broad spectrum; uh, these are just isolates. So, CBD, uh, two to one ratio of CBD to CBG two to one ratio of CBD to uh, CBG with a little THC put in there. So it's still qualified as hemp. And then CBD with this little bit of THC. Um, they were all hundred milligrams per milliliter, uh, all in MCT oil. They started low and went slow and were administered with food. And so um, just wanna show some of the um, improvements. So nine out of 10 patients that had insomnia had marked improvements, not just a little bit, but really significant improvements. Five out of five patients with anxiety improved. Out of, in musculoskeletal pain, three out of five had uh, marked improvements. All, all of those three were on uh, the formula with the CBG and the THC in it. Uh, impulsive, compulsive behavior improve, improved in both of the patients that had that, and hallucinations improved in six out of seven patients. When it comes to motor symptoms associated with Parkinson's disease, really nobody had improvement except one patient had some attenuation of his rigidity after he reached four and a half milligrams of THC daily. Now, uh, this is something we've talked about a lot before on the webinar, you know, treating Parkinson's with cannabis. I, I know my experience is that I tend to see improvement in all of these other uh, comorbid symptoms like sleep, pain, depression, anxiety, uh, you know, all the stuff except for the reason they came to me, which is they want help with their motor symptoms, meaning their tremor and their ability to move around uh, and, you know, to walk and to not be so rigid. I do see some improvement in rigidity, but it's usually not profound. So it's just interesting that this study 
uh, really um, kind of mimics what I've seen in the clinic, even though in the clinic, I'm leaning much more heavily on THC and much less so on, on CBD and CBG. And I'll show you the doses that were used in just another slide. Um, but, but this would be something I would expect once reaching a, a moderate level of THC, getting some improvement in rigidity. Out of all these, um, what I think uh, 20 or so patients, 19 patients, the only reported adverse effect was drowsiness and that was promptly reversed with dose reduction. So no, no real uh, downsides in this treatment. Uh, in, in terms of um, you know, points from the discussion I found interesting, uh, there's something called REM sleep behavior disorder that happens in Parkinson's uh, with uh, you know, movement at, at night. And um, this can be due to a defect in the cholinergic system. So not enough acetylcholine or uh, cholinergic signaling. And CBD has been shown to enhance this type of signaling in the basal forebrain, which is an area very relevant uh, to Parkinson's. Um, and so this, uh, and so, you know, CBD was helping with insomnia in these cases, especially with the uh, REM sleep uh, behavior disorder. The study also suggests that lower doses than previously reported uh, could be effective perhaps due to entourage. So there was a human study looking at CBD for REM sleep disorder uh, in Parkinson's patients and they needed 75 to 300 milligrams, but this study needed a lot less. So I just selected a few of the cases. I didn't wanna you know, belabor and, and take the time to go through everything here, um, but, but I'll just show you some examples. So, you know, the first patient had uh, pain, compulsion, insomnia, REM sleep behavior disorder, and anxiety. Uh, the effect was good. The overall effect was good. This is the one that had reduction of rigidity with four and a half milligrams of THC. Uh, so what was he taking? His daily dose of CBD was 100 milligrams. His daily dose of CBG was 50 milligrams. And the daily dose of THC was four and a half milligrams. Uh, here's another case where they had limited benefit. It, it was mostly ineffective for the motor symptoms, uh, low back pain, and the REM sleep behavior disorder. Uh, he discontinued treatment after one month. Uh, this patient number two was just doing the purified CBD. He was not getting CBG or THC. And, you know, that's probably why. Too bad his clinician didn't choose a, a more complex formula for him. Uh, here's another case of uh, insomnia, REM sleep disorder, pain, mild hallucinations, had very good results, uh, was able to stop using Ambien or Zolpidem. Uh, fewer episodes of somnambulism, you know, moving around uh, at night, uh, you know, kind of uh, sleepwalking. This patient was using, on average, uh, 41 milligrams of CBD and 20 milligrams of CBG during the day. So these are pretty modest doses. That's the whole daily dose. So that's divided into two. So 20 of CBD and 10 of CBG twice a day, getting good results with this. I, I think that's pretty impressive. Stopping Ambien, you know, it, that's, that's powerful. And, and so I'm not going to show these all. This is available on ResearchGate. You can download it and, and take a look. I just want to move on. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're cool cases, but I think you, you get the point. Uh, I'll just move on to the, a few of the uh, Lewy body dementia cases. Uh, so here's someone that had severe hallucinations, wandering, REM sleep disorder, fast cognitive decline and sundowning, had uh, good results, um, uh, uh, mild mental confusion in doses above 45 milligrams of the two to one formula, stable on the actual dose. The actual dose was 30 milligrams of CBD and 15 of CBG. That's, that's divided twice daily. So 15 and seven and a half give good, good response to these symptoms. Again, that seems pretty potent. I'm, in, I'm impressed. Um, and then, uh, you know, also really um, hard to believe was this patient who uh, had insomnia with nocturnal agitation, marked Parkinsonism with gait balance problems, cognitive fluctuations, and uh, pain due to arterial insufficiency. This patient was taking five total milligrams of CBD daily and had a good result with that. And clozapine was withdrawn. You know, I, I shake my head, but sometimes cannabis really works at these very low doses. And sometimes we try the high doses without trying the low doses and, and we miss something. So I like to point that out that you know, there could be something there with five milligrams of CBD. I would have never expected it, but cannabis is constantly giving me things that I don't expect. And that is the end of a very long slideshow. Thank you for sticking with us, everyone. Let's take a little stretch. I don't want to stay, keep my guests 
around for too long, but we'll take some time to answer a few more questions and have a nice discussion. Um, yeah, have a drink, have a stretch, move with your body around. That was a long one. But now we all know a lot more about CBG. I am going to, um, we had some previously submitted questions, which I like to answer uh, first, since that's what um, people submit them for, for that purpose. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to dig in here. Uh, the first question was, um, any information on treating a Wegener's disease, also known as uh, granulomatous uh, with polyangitis? I have never treated that condition, or I mean, it sounds slightly familiar to me, but I, I don't recall that. Um, I believe it's a painful condition. Uh, have you had any experience, Bonnie, with that? I haven't treated any patients with that, although I did take a look since I got the question, those questions ahead of time. Um, they're using immunosuppressants to treat these patients. So certainly uh, cannabis may play a role and may help to modulate the immune system in these patients. Again, in terms of prevention, it's hard to know, but when there's vasculitis and pain, certainly cannabis should be considered. Thank you. Another question was asking about uh, CBDA and CBG for neuropathic pain in cancer patients. Uh, can they be taken together? Well, I think we've talked a lot about how probably very good to take them together. You saw a lot of cases of Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia where they were taken together. There could be some people at certain doses were taking them together, doesn't work well. Uh, what about dose recommendations? Uh, what am I seeing for CBDA and pain? I've been pretty impressed. I, I think people are often responding as little as five to 10 milligrams. And I've had very few people go up more than uh, 20 or 30 milligrams of CBDA. CBG, I have less experience with, but it seems like in that same range, right? Less than 30 milligrams. Would you agree, Bonnie? Yes, I've had two, three cases where people have gone higher I had a gentleman, 90 years old, who's been my patient for a long time, takes a whole bunch of kind of low dose stuff to maintain wellness. And he's been doing really well. And lo and behold, he developed gout and went to about five different doctors. And all he got was opioid after opioid after opioid, which he was unwilling to take. And we started him on 50 milligrams a day CBDA and titrated up very quickly at 200 milligrams twice a day. So big dose, 400 milligrams a day, his gout was completely eliminated after getting to that dose after about four days. So um, I was very aggressive uh, because he that. was miserable. Um, and then with other patients with CBG, normally, again, I have, a, it's got a, it's like CBD. It has a wide range, a wide therapeutic range. It seems like some people respond to two milligrams. And then other people need 40, 50, 60 milligrams. I haven't gone higher than 100 milligrams with CBG on anybody just yet. Okay. Yeah, great, great gout case. I mean, kind of similar dosing to indomethacin. And that one, um, you know, rodent study that looked at COX inhibition with CBDA, mm -hmm. I think it was comparable to indomethacin. And so I love the way you're thinking on that. Yeah. And, and you know, what's the downside of using high doses of CBDA? No from, side effects. Yeah. No side effects. And I always think of you start low, go slow, but don't be afraid to keep going. So yeah. that was my motto with that guy. Cause he was really miserable. He actually contemplated suicide. He said, I'm not going to continue to live like this. And that was why I, I was, he said, I'll do whatever you say. So we just ramped it up and we got great results. He was thrilled. Wow. Awesome case. All right. We'll take one more previously submitted and then turn it over to a live question. Um, or maybe two more. This says, uh, this is from Sarah Lee. Will CBG work better than CBD for either asthma or long-term systemic infections? Uh, you know, probably depends on the case. It seems like CBG has the strongest antimicrobial effect. So that might be something to try for long-term systemic infections, but it, it probably really depends on the type of infection. I doubt CBG is effective antimicrobially against everything. Um, uh, and as, as for asthma, I've seen people do well with CBD and THC and, and CBDA. Uh, I haven't seen CBG. Curious if you have any thoughts, Bonnie. Um, I think you mentioned, so I was looking at bronchodilation. We have to know, you know, it seems that the mechanism of action for bronchodilation is direct stimulation of CB1. And it looks like maybe CBG has a little stimulation. I don't know that it's enough. I know very low dose THC can cause bronchodilation. 
In terms of infection, I have to tell you that I'm always, I, I don't know dosing for infections. I haven't really treated anybody other than who, patients who have, um, like who are colonized with MRSA, MRSA who get like little breakouts. I've treated them with topical cannabis products. But in terms of infections, I, I'm always kind of scratching my head about what dose and how long. And because remember, untreated infections can become a real big issue and you can land in the hospital. And so um, I'm usually a bit nervous about treating patients not knowing without, without clinical trials. It's hard to know what dose of which cannabinoid for what infection. I don't know how yeah. you feel about that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It seems like you know, what I would add is um, it seems like CBD and CBDA can have benefits in asthma, not via bronchodilation, but probably via the anti-inflammatory effects. And, and that might not just be asthma, but as some of you that have been with the webinar previously, we, we looked at some animal model data, or maybe it was ex vivo model data in of, uh, you know, SARS. Uh, oh, no, it was, yeah, the, the R R ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome model, uh, showing that I, I think uh, CBD and or CBDA uh, was effective at reducing inflammation and, and improving uh, that type of lung inflammation. Um, yeah, as far as chronic infections go, I mean, in my neck of the woods, we have a lot of tick-borne disease. I see people doing very well with cannabis in terms of symptomatic treatment and kind of balancing out their physiology so that they can respond better to these chronic infections. I'm not sure that it's having a direct antimicrobial effect in these cases. My, what I suspect is that it's just helping their immune system fight the infection. Uh, some of the exceptions to that rule might be that I've, I've seen people do, you know, in certain cases, uh, when they switch over to a high dose, kind of like a cancer type protocol, uh, get better when they have not gotten better uh, using low kind of symptomatic doses. And so maybe you know, what I'm suspecting is they're probably just getting a ton of essential oils and terpenes, which have antimicrobial effects, mm -hmm. high doses of THC and THCA, um, you know, probably are, are having some antimicrobial effects. Uh, the other thing worth mentioning is that there's just a tiny bit of data that um, THC might not be good when the infection is due to yeast. Uh, and, you know, there's just a couple animal models that have shown worsening uh, uh, candida infections when THC was given. So we'll throw that out there too. All right, let's, um, let's take a question from Shelly. I'm going to unmute you. Hello, Shelly. Hi, how are you? It's an honor to be here. Um, I have a couple, two questions. Um, as far as CBG is concerned, are there any contraindications with um, CBG and those on antihypertensives? You know, uh, THC can lower blood pressure, CBD can lower blood pressure. CBG can theoretically lower blood pressure. So I say if somebody's overtreated with antihypertensives, uh, you know, that would be the first place that I, you know, would be concerned about is, you know, adding cannabis in any form could lower blood pressure a little bit. It's not going to lower it a lot, but if somebody's already dangerously low, then they might need to be careful, uh, you know, about an additive effect. And no concerns as far as, well, no, I shouldn't say no concerns, but depending on the type of antihypertensive, whether it's a beta blocker or an ACE inhibitor, is there any difference? Well, I think beta blockers are more problematic because uh, when somebody is um, getting low pressure, like too low for their physiology, usually they can raise their heart rate to compensate partially for that. Uh, but the beta blocker could prevent the heart rate from going up as well. So if it's truly just a, a vasodilator or ACE inhibitor, you know, I, I think that would be less problematic. But if their blood pressure is low and their heart rate's low, it's going to be more symptomatic. Okay. And my second question is with CBG um, being shown to cross the blood brain barrier, um, could it be potentially helping or, or inhibiting um, the uptake of medications, uh, other medications, SSRIs, SNRIs, um, THC, and CBD? Does it make it work better? Does it, does it make, can it inhibit them? Yeah, um, it's, it's possible. You know, there was a study, I, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't think many people know, not much of the stuff has been studied at the blood brain barrier and the, the BBB of rodents could be different than humans and that could be different than humans that are healthy versus those that have disease. But there was one interesting study we covered recently um, that looked at the absorption of CBDA in the intestine. 
And it turned out that low levels of THC or CBG significantly, like 16 fold, improved the absorption of CBDA. And that that was due to the inhibition of this efflux pump is called the, the breast cancer resistance protein. The name doesn't really describe a lot of what it does, but basically as the CBDA gets absorbed into the intestine, it gets kicked back. I mean, into the, into the blood, it gets kicked back out into the intestine by this efflux pump and the presence of small amounts of THC or CBG prevented it from getting kicked back out. So CBDA levels were much higher in that context. Could something like that be happening at the blood-brain barrier? Yeah, I think it could, but I don't think we know. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let me get back to the, uh, the previously submitted. This is from uh, Pam, uh, who thanks us both, Bonnie, for our contributions to this field. And I'm sure that thanks goes to Ethan as well. Um, uh, what are the uses for cannabis that have the most research? If you had to pick the top five or the top dozen, uh, yeah, at least some promising data in humans, uh, placebo controlled. Wow. So, uh, I mean, pain is up there. I, pain is probably the best. Uh, mm -hmm. Multiple sclerosis, all the Sativex, like whatever mm -hmm. Sativex has been studied for, right? Epilepsy. Yeah. Epile well, right. Epidiolex right. trial. So epilepsy, right. pain, and multiple sclerosis. Um, There's a fair amount of research on nausea vomiting because that was one yeah. of the first indications. Yep. Chemotherapy uh, induced yeah. nausea and vomiting, especially. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's not a huge amount of research on anything because of the restriction, but luckily we are seeing an uptick. Uh, you know, I just recently reviewed PTSD for a talk and there's a fair amount of research out there now, just, just in the last three to four years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, PTSD is growing. It's lagging behind. I mean, I think when we started practicing, we were seeing, I was seeing a lot of pain in a lot of PTSD mm -hmm. patients. It seemed like here's all this evidence for pain and there's like none on PTSD. Uh, and now, what, now we're starting to get there. Right. Autism and, is also building huge interest and a huge number of uh, articles published just last year in 2020. Maybe COVID helped with that because people were home and, and not running around and doing more research. Yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, Simone, I don't want to um, like step out of order. Uh, is it, I see Lonnie with his hand raised. Is he next or is there somebody that's queued up for the next live question? Um, there was one other person ahead of Lonnie and then I have one other person after him. Okay, cool. I'll let you call on that first person then. All right, um, Lee was next. Let me see if she's still on. Yep. Hi, thank you. Great topic. I love this central topic. And um, I just actually had a question of serotonin syndrome because you presented um, dust in one of the cases about it enhancing it. Um, so do you worry about CVG with um, people that are already on um, SSRIs to promote, you know, can it cause serotonin syndrome in them? And then just another small question, are these genetically modified plants that don't have the synthase enzymes? Okay, good question. I can answer the second question first. Uh, they're genetically modified through breeding, not through like GMO type practices, but um, the breeding is enhanced by uh, gene analysis. And so um, basically what, what these breeders can do is get the cycle turnover between one generation and the next much faster because they're able to select which are the individual plants that have the desirable genes and mutations and then keep on inbreeding them with each other faster and faster. So it's, a, it's, um, it's just accelerated basically, but it's not unnatural genetic manipulation. It's through breeding. Now, as far as serotonin syndrome goes, you know, I don't know about serotonin syndrome. For, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's this like rare potential disease where people get hot and red and it could be life-threatening and very dangerous um, when stacking multiple drugs that act on the serotonin system. I've been warned about it. You know, clinicians are supposed to look at it. I have no idea if it's more or less common than being struck by lightning, even when people are on multiple agents. Um, if anybody wants to correct me with if I'm wrong, but it, I, I don't know how concerning it is, honestly. I think it's, I, I still sometimes say to people, like if they're adding CBD or CBDA, 
to um, you know a serotonergic drug, you know, please, if you get really hot and red, don't keep taking this. And if it doesn't go away quickly, go to the hospital. But I don't, I don't know. What do you think about serotonin syndrome, Bonnie? I haven't seen it either. And maybe, you know, look, I work in the world of pediatrics, but I do have taken care of plenty of adults who had um, have been taking cannabis for years and years in combination with many drugs, and I just have not seen it. Yeah, I think it's one of those kind of obscure things that we learn to warn people about. Lee, have you ever seen it in your whole career? Oh, you're muted again. Sorry. Let me unmute you. So you've been you've spent lots of time in the ER too. Have you seen serotonin syndrome? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen it in the ER. I just, um, you know, I haven't, my cannabis practice is newer. And um, so I was just wondering, because you do get a lot of people for anxiety and CBG is supposed to be good for it. And then you showed the study that said it could enhance the SSRIs, but I have seen it in the ER and it's not pleasant. People, people are very uncomfortable and, and uh, you do worry about blood pressure and everything else. Okay. All right, and I believe we've got, um, well, actually, let, I wanna make sure we finish the spreadsheet before uh, we move on, and there's just two more. Um, so this one's for you, Bonnie. Do you think FDA approved, it, it's an easy one. It could Epidiolex be more effective if it had a full spectrum instead of an isolate? And then also, can you explain why you say anti-inflammatory effects instead of calling them an anti-inflammatory uh, the, I think that second part of the question, they're basically the same thing, but what do you think about Epidiolex? Well, so look, uh, you know, I get a lot of grief for this. I am, everything needs to be on the table for these kids uh, and for adults as well. When you're in that group of treatment resistant epilepsy and your doctor's telling you there's nothing else, how are you to afford, look, I have patients taking 2000 milligrams a day of CBD to control their seizures. Their parents are going broke. It's very, now their child is doing great and it looks like it's gonna live a nice long life. How do you prepare for that financially? I have, I do believe Epidiolex um, would probably get a, would probably have, this is just my opinion, would have better results if it was more whole plant. And yes, it had the right terpenes in it and a little more THC in it. However, um, what I have done with some patients who financially have not been able to afford the full dose of whole plant, they have been able to get a prescription for Epidiolex depending on their neurologist and their condition. And they take half of their dose as Epidiolex and the other half as whole plant. There's no reason you can't mix them. And we are seeing some very nice results with a lower financial burden on the family. So again, everything on the table if I, if we could get free medicine or insurance covered whole plant, that would be the way to go. But there is a study that came out in 2018. You've probably seen, maybe you've talked about it, uh, Dustin, by um, Pamplona about like an observational meta-analysis looking at uh, whole plant and, and kind of purified CBD. And when you compare just looking in the, in the observational, it's 71% effect uh, benefits with the whole plant versus something like, I don't know, 45 or 46%. But if you hold them both to a greater than 50% reduction of seizures, they're comparable. But yeah. certainly less side effects with whole plant. I'll just put that lower dose and lower side effects, significant. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good strategy. If people can at least get some of this broad spectrum, that's almost certainly better than none. I, I was just looking at the chat and I saw that Jehan is present. Jehan Marku, if, if you have any comments or anything you want to add to anything that we've talked about tonight, I always really value your opinion. Um, raise your hand and I'll, I'll unmute you. Uh, but, and thanks for attending. I'm so flattered that my you know, colleagues and people I really respect uh, join in uh, and it's often surprising. But let's, um, let's go with the next live question. And that is Lonnie. So Lonnie, you should be able to unmute now. Hello, and thank you for such an amazing webinar tonight, Dr. Sulak, Dr. Goldstein, and Dr. Russo. It's amazing to have all three of you here. Um, I have a few questions. I have uh, been working with uh, patients using CBG Keef recently. The past month, I came across that. I've been adding it. I have uh, been talking to uh, Dustin, and I've asked some questions of Dr. Russo in the past. 
And I make these CBD products that I'm using in experiments with patients of mine that suffer from PTSD and neurodivergence. And I've had great success with the CBD alone, using it in a partially decarboxylated manner to keep the acidic cannabinoids present. Adding CBG is something that's the next step. I've been experimenting with it myself. I've given it to them separately. I have not combined it in one product yet. But the experiment so far, I've noticed my heart racing at some points. I've had to radically reduce the amount that I take. It's got that biphasic uh, aspect mm -hmm. to the anxiety, the reports. I'm hearing it really helps with that. I've also noticed it really suppresses my appetite. I mean, to the point where I put some clothes on to go to a conference last week and all of a sudden it's, you know, I need a belt. <laughs> you know, different things that I'm noticing, but um, I'm really wondering and uh, coming to the point of having Dr. Goldstein here, in terms of neurodivergence, looking at children with autism, I have children with seizure disorders as well and uh, anxiety. What are your thoughts and do you have any guidance on how to use these products? Uh, sure. So um, I have seen some really spectacular results in children with autism. I've spoken about them here and there. I haven't published anything. I have patients taking very low doses between two and 20 milligrams a day um, with about a third of patients who try it who are nonverbal or low, um, uh, low speech have had incredible advancement of speech to the point where the parents are saying, how is it possible that this little bottle and these little you know, 0.3 mLs is making my child speak? So I have a case also of a child who had uh, birth trauma, had three strokes right around birth, has some CP, has a, you know, not too bad seizure disorder who we started on CBD to kind of help with, parents were very nervous about THC, it was like a 25 to one ratio, who did quite well with CBD, we saw some improvement in behavior, improvement in focus and so on. When we added CBG, it was like catapult. I mean, this kid just took off. So in the right brain, I do think, and I don't mean right brain, I mean the correct brain, you may see some really spectacular benefits. However, I agree with you biphasic. I've had some patients and I always warn families, if you're gonna start a cannabinoid, you must understand that low dose may aggravate your child, but that does not mean it's not going to work. What it means is we're gonna kind of escalate up to the higher doses. I have used high dose CBG. I think I have a, a teenager who's about, he's a like adult size, big teenager, who found um, anxiety, ADHD, got diagnosed with Tourette, but wasn't a terrible case of it. Um, a little bit of OCD as well, who took, uh, was taking 40 milligrams of CBG divided in two doses with very good results, but started to have some sleep issues. Even though people report, and Ethan's paper reports some benefit with sleep, some patients in my practice, about 25% report CBG late in the day is too stimulating. So we just give it in the morning. So um, I hope that helps you. I, I've added it to patients with cancer who have really, you know, stage four, it doesn't look good. In addition to CBD and THC, I have added CBG when there is some uh, reports in the literature as well. And for those patients, I've gone as high as 60 to 100 milligrams a day they really don't have a lot of side effects from CBG. I think it, again, depends on the baseline chemistry and again, the kids with autism epilepsy do have some baseline chemistry that's gonna be different from most people. It's interesting that you lost weight because a lot of people report that it helps with appetite. Ooh, I found that the acidic version does something very stimulating. The non-acidic version does something a little bit different. It actually enhances the other cannabinoids. Um, I actually had one other question. I saw it in the chat, and I don't know if Dustin has seen that, but it's sort of related to this. Another patient that I have who has PANDAS, and he's also on the spectrum. Yeah. Very intelligent young man. Do you think this could be helpful for a case like that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my yeah. the bulk of my experience with PANDAS is um, with THC and mm -hmm. controlling the more severe behaviors, and it, it seems to work well in, in some cases and not in others. Uh, but I I use clonidine a lot in in pandas. Um, you know some of these some of these young people 
Uh, so for those of you that don't know, this is a, a type of a neuroinflammation that can cause psychotic-like symptoms, and it, it may be related to an autoimmune process and or a chronic infection, um, uh, but they, they can kind of like get triggered all of a sudden, it's, and parents constantly describe it like it's like a different person, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and they will show signs of hypersympathetic activity, you know, they're, they, they start shaking, their face gets white, their, you know, pupils get dilated, and then they can attack themselves themselves or other people, and it can be extremely dangerous. Um, and I found clonidine to be useful in some of these cases. So potentially CBG could do what clonidine is doing and maybe do more and do better. Thank you. That is awesome. Thank you so and, much. Uh, yeah. And I'm curious to hear your comments about pandas. Uh, well, and now I think we're typically calling it pans. The AS stands for associated with strep. And now we know that's much more than just strep that can cause this. Are you asking you, me, Justin? Yeah, what, oh, what do yeah. you think, Bonnie, about pandas and uh, cannabis in general or CBG? Right. So I've treated a handful of patients with pandas and we've had success with high dose CBD, very high doses. So, you know, epilepsy doses in some patients. And then and part, part of that comes from, you know, families not being willing to use THC. They get very nervous about it. And you know how that goes. But also I've had some patients, the only thing they did respond to was THC. Uh, and I've also had some really nice success with just a one-to-one -one ratio, CBD, THC, and a one-to-one -one ratio allows for THC to do its thing and also help mitigate some of, maybe some of the unwanted side effects. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to jump ahead and unmute uh, Jehan. If you're uh, willing to make any comments on CBG or anything that we talked about tonight or just say hello, it's great to have you. Uh, thank you, Dustin, so much. Um, this is, it's been a great way to spend a Wednesday evening out here on the East Coast. Um, I just wanted to actually go back to CBGA and um, just throw something out there to see if uh, you and your, your fellow panelists might want to comment. Um, I think CBGA is really interesting, partly because there isn't a lot of information out there. And it seems to be like a weak agonist at a lot of stuff like uh, to trip A1, trip M8 receptor, um, other receptors like that. Um, trip V2, mag lipase, you know, COX-1, COX-2. And so I was wondering if, you know, maybe CBGA might be modulating signaling um, because sometimes when you have two drugs that like the same target, they can either enhance one of the other's activity through some sort of competition or they can, can competitively inhibit each other. But I guess I wanted to just uh, throw out this idea. Maybe you can comment on CBGA as this factor that can maybe enhance the signaling of other cannabinoids because it hits so many other targets, albeit weekly, but it hits a lot of targets uh, very weekly. But anyway, I just wanted to share that. Um, but I think this is uh, webinar discussion has been fantastic. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I, I, you know, I, I kind of had similar thoughts and that's why I included it in our CBG formula, right? We had such success with CBD, um, you know, in the healer, the straight CBD formula from healer is actually six to one CBD to CBDA. And what we found is that a lot of people are coming back and saying, wow, when I switch over to this formula from other products, it seems to be so much more potent and, and work better at lower doses. And I'm attributing that to CBDA. And so, you know, when it came to formulate CBG, I basically just copied that same pattern uh, wondering if if you'd be right, if it could kind of potentiate some of these benefits, and and also you know even though I don't I'm not aware of it being studied, it's possible that CBGA is much more uh, bioavailable, has better absorption through the gut than CBD, which we see with both THCA and and CBDA. So a little CBGA might go a long way, and it might be a nice complement to CBG. Um, so that's what I'm suspecting, but I've got no evidence to prove that, and hopefully we'll we'll figure that out soon. And and what about you, Bonnie? Anybody taking CBGA and that you've seen? No, I haven't had anybody taking any. Well, CBGA dominant. It looks like some products that patients are using with CBG have a small amount of CBGA, but I again, when you're you. You have something that's got multiple compounds. It's always hard to tease out what's doing what. So I, I can't really comment sure. on CBGA by itself. For sure. Well, we are so late here. Let's, um, I know that Sean is, we'll, we'll do some rapid fire lightning questions at the end. Sean, <laughs> you're up, man. What, how are you? And, uh, and what's your question or comment tonight? Okay. My question is quickly for um, uh, the use of CBG in plaque psoriasis. 
I currently am using a, a type two chemovar um, that's very high in beta caryophylline. And um, I was just thinking, you know, I'm having some pretty good, um, you know, my, my patches aren't as bad, but with CB adding some sort of CBG formulation, I, I heard Dr. Russo speak to this <laughs> once, would that really give me the bang that I really need to really, you know, really tackle this? Um, I'm, I'm currently using T's for the psoriatic arthritis part, which is getting along quite well. So that was my question. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I kind of, and in that, in that diagram I showed that showed all the potential uses of CBG, one of those little arrows was pointing to psoriasis. I didn't include that as a main point in my slides, and I can uh, definitely get you that chapter of that textbook if you want. It was, it was based on some of those trip uh, ion channels. Uh, I can't remember which ones <laughs> right now. Um, uh, Jehan probably knows, but, but I, I can, you know, if you write us, I can get you that chapter, but yeah, I think that it could be a nice compliment to what you're already doing. I would certainly try CBG. And can I just add in maybe try topical CBG? I have a patient that had one of the most horrendous case of psoriasis and taking CBG orally combined with topical made a big difference. Awesome. Great to know. All right, Laura, I believe you are the last one, or hopefully the last one. Justin, uh, Rachel's been waiting patiently since- Oh, I sorry, it's Rachel. Yeah. Rachel, where's mm -hmm. Rachel? Go for it, Simone. And then Laura will get to you. I think she might have left. All right. Laura. Sorry, Rachel. <laughs> okay, well, um, go ahead, Laura. And um, if Rachel comes back, we'll take her question. Hi, thank you so much for taking my question and, and for all the work that you all do in, in this space. Um, you might want to unmute Jehan for this too, because I know he's going to want to in. Um, I am a licensed clinical social worker. I'm an addiction therapist and uh, the founder of the Comclon Collected. Um, I know, Dr. Sulak, in your presentation, you alluded to CBG having promised to manage opioid withdrawal. Um, so I, I know you've done a lot of work and, and I've read a lot that you've had to say about the efficacy of CBD for um, withdrawal and, and for um, addiction cessation. I was wondering if you could elaborate on CBG's role in that and maybe even talk about it in comparison to the current MAT treatments like Suboxone or Buprenorphine. Thanks. Okay, sure. So um, for opioid withdrawal, you know, first of all, I think THC is a very powerful agent. If you look at the symptoms of opioid withdrawal, you've got nausea and vomiting and diarrhea and this hypersympathetic activity. Uh, you've got insomnia, muscle spasms, and then cravings, uh, anxiety. All of these things are driving people toward relapse, you know, and, and this is the acute phase of withdrawal. And, and when I look at that list of symptoms, that pretty much matches up with THC strengths. And so I, I really um, go with that. Now, when I have people that are in acute uh, withdrawal, sometimes THC isn't enough. And I also offer this uh, cocktail, you know, basically. And so I use clonidine. Uh, that's the alpha-2 agent. And that is for the agitation. Um, so they're shaking, they're sweating, they're having the hypersympathetic symptoms. Um, clonidine works extremely well for that. I'll use uh, a combination of promethazine and loperamide for the GI symptoms. So these are both, uh, you know, the anti-emetic and the anti-diarrheal, but they both have dopamine activity, which can also make the person settle down and get a little sleepy and just kind of satisfy that need for the dopamine fix. Um, and then I use sometimes cyclobenzaprine if, if THC isn't controlling the muscle spasms enough. Uh, it, when it comes to CBD, I think that, um, you know, that can in high doses help with the acute withdrawal symptoms, but I think it's going to be a much more expensive treatment than THC. I think at doses that a lot of people can afford, I wouldn't expect, you know, very impressive results with CBD. Now, the, the research on CBD uh, decreasing the um, the cue induced cravings, like some of that uh, research that Yasmin Hurd did, where even seven days after a single dose of CBD, people are still having you know less cravings when they're exposed to a heroin cue. Yeah, you know that that's just so powerful, and I so I think we should really keep CBD in mind when it comes to the neuroplastic changes needed to get someone over their addiction and to make them less susceptible to relapse. I think CBD has a lot of promise. 
And so taking that all together, what role might CBG have? I think CBG could potentially help with the hypersympathetic symptoms, that agitation that happens with withdrawal, which is quite miserable for, from what I hear from people. Um, yeah, and, and uh, any, any comments, Jehan? Anything you'd like to add to that? Um, sure. So I've done some clinical research, um, observational work research in, with uh, cannabis products, case reports, and, and retrospective analysis. And you know, unfortunately, CBG wasn't the things that one of the things we saw in the products people were using or, or were able to track. But I think I want to just stress, um, you know, I, you know, as editor in chief of a journal, we get a lot of like wild things that should never be published. And we also get some concerning things that we think we should publish right away or trying to figure out the best way to deliver them. And, and however rare they are, um, I, um, I am aware of some adverse events associated with CBG rich products. Now it's not saying, you know, CBG is a culprit or it's, you know, it's a perpetrator or is it the victim of a drug drug interaction that there's a lot of factors that go into that. But um, I definitely, um, I think Ethan Russo's article also speaks to this, that there are some adverse events with these substances, and especially with opioid use and, and, and getting more into the weeds on clinical research in doing a proper opioid trial. You know, there's this window that's very difficult uh, when people are transitioning from, you know, a pharmacological treatment to nothing or from one pharmacological treatment to another when treating opioid abuse. And um, if they have an adverse event with a product, um, I think that that can limit its success. So again, um, you know, I've seen some unpublished, unsupported uh, rumors, um, let's just call them, about adverse events associated with CBG-rich products that are used also in combination with nicotine products like the, like a CBG blunt. Um, so I don't know if anyone else has experienced that. Again, you know, uh, people send me all sorts of stuff to read, but I didn't know if any of uh, the, my colleagues on here might think of a rationale why someone might have an adverse event from a CBG rich product, like, uh, you know, losing consciousness or getting really confused or dizzy. Um, anyway, I, I just wanted to share that again. I, I can't substantiate any of these case reports about adverse events, um, but again, I, I sift through a lot of this stuff. So. Any yeah, guidance yeah. here would be would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh wow, we're really cooking here. Uh, longest webinar ever, and it keeps getting better. I, you know, I I would just guess that um, you know the antihypertensive effects mm -hmm. could be the biggest culprit there. But uh, but who knows, right? We we've got so much to learn about this. Um, and Dr. Goldstein, do you ever see anything in um, your pop the population that you work with? I mean, kids are definitely. Um, a population that's affected by the opioid crisis? Is it something that you, you've you seen or experienced? Not so much. Okay. Thanks. No, I don't really see kids with, you know, who, and I'll tell you that children with pain are undertreated because people are afraid to put them on opioids. So there may be teenagers abusing opioids, but it is very unusual for, um, and except in dire cases where children are dying of cancer or so on, they are just, they don't get, I, I get kids that come in crying with 10 out of 10 pain and nobody's addressing it because they're terrified to give them opioid. Thank you. Thank you all. Yep. Thank you, Laura. Okay. Well, thanks for the 223 that stuck with us for the two <laughs> plus hours. Incredible. Thank you so much, Bonnie, for your generous thank you. donation of time and experience and expertise. And uh, we've got a trade, so we'll, we'll schedule uh, the next, uh, how I can get you back and, and uh, repay you for, for all that you gave to our community tonight. Uh, for those of you listening that feel like you received something of value tonight, and if you feel compelled to uh, make an exchange uh, so that you're in a fair position for receiving this value, I encourage you to go to healercbd.com, buy some CBG from us, use the coupon code CBG for 20% discount, come back next month and tell us about your experience. We just have so much to learn from each other. And if that doesn't interest you, you could go to healer.com and sign up for the training. Uh, code webinar for $50 off. It's a uh, great training uh, community, uh, great curriculum, all the webinars recorded. And uh, we are uh, getting ready to produce some new content for the training curriculum uh, related to specific conditions. So get excited about that. 
And uh, just thank you all. I, ho I hope you have a great month and uh, take this information and continue to do the good work you're doing. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Good night, everyone. <laughs>